Hey everybody, what's going on and welcome to Guns N' Roses Central and it's Monday morning which means it's time to talk about this week's Guns N' Roses news. So the first story we're talking about is the new Jumanji movie that's out. It's called Jumanji Welcome to the Jungle and there was an article by Cinema Blend about why the movie is named after a Guns N' Roses song. So one of the things that made the trailer for Jumanji look so much fun is the use of, of course, Welcome the Jungle, a song which gave the, gave the film its subtitle. Apparently a decision to call the movie Welcome to the Jungle was made during production and the cast and crew were filming the movie in the rainforest of Hawaii. It seems that Jack Black would sing the song on the set and eventually suggested the title to director Jay Kasten. Kasten loved the idea so much that the song is now a key part of the film's marketing as well as its title. If you guys want to read the entire article, I've linked to it down below, but let's go on to our next piece of Guns N' Roses news. So it looks like we've also got a couple documentaries coming out that will feature Guns N' Roses in uh, some way or the other. So there's a new documentary coming out uh, called uh, Sinister's Music, Mayhem, and Melrose Avenue, 85 to 90. So apparently the maker of this documentary was a roadie for the band London back in the day when Izzy was actually in the lineup and later worked for GNR in their early days. So LA Weekly did a whole... Uh, write up on the actual movie and uh, the actual producer of the movie as well. So, in the actual uh, article, they talk about uh, some of the big bands Guns N' Roses, Jane's Addiction, and the Red Hot Chili Peppers. They said not only did the bands break out of the local underground into worldwide mainstream, despite depravity, drug use, and drama that encircled them, but all are still here selling out stadiums, getting radio play, and attracting new generation of fans. What was happening in L.A. at the time that inspired them? So the documentary, Sinister's Music, Mayhem, and Melrose Avenue, 85-90, to showing Sunday, September 24th at Beyond Bark as part of the uh, Tequila Mockingbird screening series for the Punk Rock Museum, explores the question through interviews with the people who were there, playing in, going to, and throwing parties at clubs like Scream, Raggies, and the Cat House. In addition to the film, which is also streaming on Amazon Prime, it shows what life was like for the neo-glam rock and goth sinisters outside of the clubs. It delves into the daytime realness of their lives with the insightful focus on the trendy Melrose Avenue, where music lovers cruised and congregated to buy the coolest clothes, shoes, and records, often sold to them by hot rockers that they had seen on stage the night before. Sinister's filmmaker Daisy Benjamin began to immerse herself in the world at the tender age of 16. Originally from Chevlot Hills, uh, Benjamin credits the obsession with reading mags like Circus, Hit Parader, Rolling Stone, and Kerrang! for the initial interest in the music scene. I would marvel about the adventures of rock stars in Hollywood and the clubs that they played in their formative years, he tells me. I was too late for Starwood, the Roxy. For, for the Starwood, the Roxy had a, had a lot of theater like Pee Wee Herman's plays and Cheech and Chong at the time, and the Whiskey was doing... Uh, dance clubs. So I frequently frequented the Troubadour to see local metal bands like London, Striper, Rat, Quiet Riot, Motley Crue, and Great White. Benjamin fancied himself a bass player, so like many pre-internet musicians, he rifed through the recycler to hook up with bands. I saw an ad for part of London's road crew and I liked the vibe of the band. Plus, I could get into the clubs for free and was paid $15 per show. Izzy Stradlin was my favorite in London as he had that Joe Perry, Johnny Thunders, and Keith Richards thing. When Stradlin quit and joined Guns N' Roses, Benjamin would eventually follow. This guy with curly hair passed me a flyer at the Troub and said, check out my band. Slash had just joined Izzy and the rest three weeks before, so I said, hey you, you want a roadie? Benjamin remembers, I first saw Guns N' Roses on June 6, 1986, and my mind was blown. They were a punk rock Aerosmith, and they were so good, kind of crazy, and I was happy to be along for their wild ride. So if you guys want to read the entire article, I've linked to it down below. I would personally love to actually see this documentary. And let me know if any of you guys are actually planning on going and seeing it, or maybe if you have an Amazon Prime account. Let's go into our next story of the week. Now, this isn't the only Guns N' Roses documentary, or a documentary that features Guns N' Roses, uh, that may be coming out soon. So we also have this other documentary that if you watched our podcast last week, you would remember Jeff talked about called Gunners. Now, if you go on IMDb, it listed as 2012, but it was updated April 30th, 2017. And if you look at the cast, it says Axl Rose, Slash, Duff McKagan, Stephen Adler, Izzy Stradlin, Matt Sorum, and Gilby Clark. Now, people may think, oh, they're interviewing all these guys for this new documentary. I think what it is, is they probably took a lot of archival footage, you know, from past interviews with MTV, you know, back in the 80s and 90s. And they're probably just doing some, something similar to, uh, you know, what A&E did about the band and VH1 did in the Behind the Music documentary. But as we get more information about this, I'll keep you guys updated. So this is actually uh, being, uh, it was written by Don Robinson. 
Now, Don Robinson's worked on that metal show as a producer as well as a writer. He's also worked on Behind the Music, VH1 Rock Docs, and as well as Lady Gaga presents the Monster Ball Tour at Madison Square Garden. So he's got a lot of experience uh, actually working on you know music-related documentaries. He even uh, also worked on another Guns N' Roses documentary in 2007 called Guns N' Roses The Story. We also have a new interview with Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins of the Foo Fighters. And Dave Grohl revealed if he thinks that Axl Rose is worthy of fronting ACDC. So in a new SRF3 interview, Foo Fighter members Dave Grohl and Taylor Hawkins discuss Guns N' Roses singer Axl Rose fronting ACDC. And the interviewer said he thinks Foo Fighters are a lot better live act today than ACDC. To which Grohl said, I saw that band on their last tour. He then joked, interviews over, what the F is that? It's ACDC, man. Hawkins said, it's like saying we're better looking than Brad Pitt. It just doesn't happen. Grohl added, just not true. It's impossible to be better looking than Brad Pitt. The interviewer said, I saw them with Axl Rose. Grohl responded, I did too. And I thought Axl did a really good job because he could get up there and sing a lot of the songs that Bond Scott used to sing. Hawkins added, I think last year was the return of Axl Rose. So we've also got some Gilby Clark news. So he's going to be embarking on a series of seven headlining dates in Canada, all in Ontario. So from September 23rd, to September 30th, he'll be playing at Newmarket, Hamilton, St. Catharines, a couple dates in Toronto, and then in Ottawa as well. So Gilby Clark will be embarking with his solo band on a Canadian micro tour. And um, the Gilby Clark band is a well-oiled three-piece that comprises of Gilby Clark on vocals, EJ Curse on bass, and Dustin Steinke on drums. And then uh, Gilby is going to be playing Toronto on September 28th and then coming back on September 30th. So he's going to be playing a charity event on September 30th uh, at the Opera House for the Kiss CF Goodbye Charity Benefit Concert. So this special concert will raise awareness and funds for cystic fibrosis, the most common fatal genetic disease affecting Canadian children and young adults. Joining Gilby Clark at the charity event will be Rock and Roll Over, which is a Kiss tribute band, Ozone Baby, which is a Led Zeppelin tribute band, and Staring at the Sun, which is a U2 tribute band. So we've got a new interview with GNR manager Alan Niven. So he was being interviewed by Mitch LaFon, and he talked about how important David Geffen and Geffen Records were for the band in reaching their rock and roll atmosphere. And he here's what he had to say. He said, David, referring to David Geffen, had no direct influence on the working process except for one which was obviously critical. He was prepared to spend $365,000 on a debut record, which I found simultaneously terrifying because that is a huge royalty hole to dig out of. And at the same time, I was pleased that we were getting this record done. But that was still an awful lot of money to spend on a debut record, and obviously he allowed that. Any other record company would have probably pulled the plug once we were spending $100,000, so there's part of your answer. I don't think another label would have put up with that kind of expenditure or abandoned that kind of reputation. I think the band would have terrified most of the other labels. In terms of would, in terms, would the band have succeeded on another label once the record was finished? That again, I doubt too. There was a lot of serendipity to certain aspects of the development of the record. And bear in mind that Eddie Rosenblatt, who was the chairman and CEO of Geffen Records at the time, in December of 1987, took me out to lunch and informed me that the label wanted to have the band come home and start preparing their second record and record their second record. At that point, we were approximately 250,000 units sold. The company's policy was, we sold a quarter of a million albums, we basically recovered our money, now it's time to look at the second album. And I looked at him across the table with a certain amount of annoyance and frustration and said, said, Eddie, we're at a quarter million sales in six months without any airplay and without any MTV airplay. Could you imagine where we might get to if we had a little bit of both? And I was thinking maybe we could maybe get this thing up to gold. You know, what did I know? I know nothing at all ever. But there was a big push for myself and Tom Zutat to stay with the record in the coming year. And part of that push was harassment of MTV by everybody to give them video airplay because they never played it. Had I sat there at lunch table and said, yes, sir, I'll do as instructed, who knows where the band might have gotten or to or where they would have been. Tom and I both felt that, now nah, we're not giving up on the sucker right now. Are you kidding me? A quarter of a million records in six months and very little support. You're smoking crack if you think we're coming home. We're staying out there. And that does it for this week's news. And to close off this week's news, uh, here's a message from Slash. So hit the like button if you guys enjoyed this video. And be sure to subscribe if you love Guns N' Roses and want to stay up to date on all things related to the band, as well as the band's side projects. Here's the message from Slash. Hi, I'm Slash, and I acted for the African Elephant. What will you act for? The world as we know it is a very delicate ecosystem and all animals have a particular role. The African elephant for me is so close to what we're all about as human beings. 
as far as being a family unit, really intelligent. What's going on with the African elephant is something that is just about criminal. Something needs to be done about it before it ends up as a, an extinct species. When a species goes extinct, other things suffer as a result. And when you have that kind of thing happening, it really pretty much spells the end. Go to oneactforall.com to see what you can do to join IFA on the fight to save the ESA.